Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor. Okay, so we've seen so far that um, Feather 2 and Van Hoot in 1988 had shown that uh, the um, thing responsible for endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization appears to be a factor because you can transfer it from a donor piece of artery which has endothelial cells to a uh, detector um, artery which doesn't have endothelial cells. Okay, so what we now want to show is um, basically that that endothelium-dependent uh, hyperpolarization factor is not a prostenoid. So I'm now telling you about prostenoids so that we can understand what prostenoids actually are. So we've seen that we have this structure, arachidonic acid, and that cyclooxygenase enzymes are going to catalyze firstly this cyclooxygenase reaction where you produce this sort of oxygen cycle here and also a peroxide link here. And the next reaction they're going to catalyze is the so-called peroxidase reaction. And basically what you're going to do is hydrolyze uh, this uh, peroxide bond here. So you're going to break the peroxide bond. Okay, now to understand this, what I need to tell you about is a molecule known as glutathione. So let me get another piece of paper and I'll tell you about glutathione. Okay, so glutathione is going to be essential in this next step uh, catalyzed by the cyclooxygenase enzymes. So let me now tell you about glutathione because it's going to provide two hydrogen atoms into the reaction, which is going to be the essential uh, thing that you're going to need in order to break that peroxide uh, bond that we had in the prostaglandin G2 molecule. Okay, so the structure of glutathione, it's a tripeptide, but it's not a conventionally linked tripeptide. So it's made of free amino acids. So we'll start with the amino acid right over at this side. So, the first amino acid is the amino acid glycine. Glycine is the simplest amino acid. Its R group is just hydrogen. So here's the alpha carbon of the glycine, and it's got a hydrogen off as its R group. Here's the amino group, which is linked to the carboxylic acid group of the next amino acid along in a peptide link. The next amino acid along is cysteine. So the R group of cysteine is you have a methylene group here, and then you have a thiol group, which is a sulfur atom linked to a hydrogen atom here. So this is the thiol group, and this is a really important group. This is one of the most important groups on the glutathione molecule. Okay, and then you have the carboxylic acid group of glutathione. Uh, no, whoops, no, not the carboxylic acid group of glutathione, of cysteine. That was over there, so take that off. Okay, so here's the amino group of the cysteine amino acid. Sorry about that. Let me circle things. Let me colour things in to make it more obvious for myself. Okay, so this amino acid here, this is the glycine amino acid here. Okay, so this is glycine. Uh, the next amino acid along, which I'll circle in blue here, this is um, cysteine. Okay, right, so this is cysteine. And finally, the final amino acid that you need in the glutathione structure is the amino acid glutamate. However, you do not link it to the normal carboxylic acid that you would link um, the uh, amino group of cysteine to. Instead, you link it to the carboxylic acid group that's in the R group of the glutamate molecule. So here is the R group of the glutamate molecule. So uh, glutamate has this sort of propanoic acid R group here. And then here's the normal structure of the glutamate amino acid, the generic amino acid structure. So here's the alpha carbon with the amino group up there, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and then the carboxylic acid group that comes off down here. So basically, here's a glutamate amino acid, and you have linked the amino group of the cysteine amino acid over there to the carboxylic acid group, not that's on the generic core amino acid structure, but that is instead on the R group of the glutamate. Okay, so this is glutamate. Now, 
Uh, glutathione is often abbreviated to GSH for short. And you might be wondering, well, where on earth did they get the S in that name from? Well, basically, you can see that glutathione is named after the gluta from glutamate and then the thiol from the cysteine amino acid here. So basically, this G is for gluta, and then this SH is for the thiol group that's off the cysteine uh, amino acid within this glutathione molecule. So that SH just means the thiol group. It's just referring to the sulfur and the hydrogen atom of the thiol group. Now, what you can do, basically, is you can bring another one of these glutathione molecules together. Okay, so if we denote the whole of the structure apart from the um, thiol group by the G. So this G represents the rest of the entire structure of the glutathione molecule. So let me circle this. So it represents all of this. Da -da 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 -da. It represents all of this. Da -da -da. It doesn't represent the thiol group. And then circle right the way around and make this horrible mess of a cover there. But never mind. So that entire thing we're just going to represent by this G here. Okay, so now what we've got effectively is G bound to this sort of thiol group here. Now what you can do is you can bring another glutathione molecule, GSH, and what you can do is you can chop off the hydrogen, okay, from the sulfur, and you do this by uh, imagine doing it by homolytic fission, which means that uh, if you imagine this bond, it has two electrons in. One electron is from the sulfur, the other is from the hydrogen. In homolytic bond fission, what happens is that you split the electrons equally, basically. One electron goes to the hydrogen, and the other electron goes to the sulfur. Okay, so basically, in this reaction, what you'll form is a hydrogen atom. So you'll get the hydrogen atom here with its one electron. Okay? And similarly, you'll do this for the other glutathione molecule. So you'll get two hydrogen atoms. Now then, both glutathione molecules, which are now just got this sulfur, the sulfur will also have an unpaired electron, like so. Okay? Now what can happen is these two sulfurs can link together. They can share their electrons together, like so and everyone's happy. Okay, so what is the name of this molecule uh, that we have formed? Well, it's known as glutathione disulfide because it's linked by this bond here, which is a disulfide bond. It's a bond involving two sulfur atoms. So this is glutathione disulfide. Okay, and it's linked together, held together by this disulfide bond in the middle. So this is a disulfide bond. Okay, so glutathione disulfide is often abbreviated to GSSG for this exact reason here. Okay, right. Now, when you bind two glutathione molecules together to make a glutathione disulfide, it produces you two hydrogen atoms. And that's going to be extremely useful if we want to hydro well, if we want to split that uh, peroxide group on our prostaglandin G2 molecule. Okay, right. So, let's get our prostaglandin G2 back and see how we're going to uh, split it, split that peroxide link uh, to uh, create prostaglandin H2. Right, so copy out the structure of prostaglandin uh, G2 again. So here is the carboxylic acid group over here. Okay, this is the first carbon, second carbon here, third carbon here, fourth carbon here, fifth carbon here, then you have the double bond the sixth carbon's here, seventh carbon's here, the eighth carbon is up there, okay? Now, we know that what we did is we split this double bond here, okay? And we have this sort of end portion here, and then we've got an oxygen peroxide link here. This was the oxygen cycle that we had here. Then we double bonded these two together here, okay? Then what we've done is we've brought this up here, We'd formed a new double bond here, split the double bond that was here, 
okay? And then we'd formed this peroxide group here, like so. So, this um, was the um, eighth carbon here, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, and then we continue on, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth, twentieth. Okay, right, so this was the structure of prostaglandin G2, okay, PGG2. Right, so we are now going to uh, catalyze another reaction, or the cyclooxygenase enzyme is going to catalyze another reaction known as the peroxidase reaction. So first it catalyzes the cyclooxygenase reaction to produce prostaglandin G2, and now it's going to catalyze the peroxidase reaction to produce prostaglandin H2 from the prostaglandin G2. Okay, so what are we going to do in this reaction? Well, basically, we're going to cut these two bonds here. Again, you can imagine doing it by homolytic fission. So we're going to create one electron left over on that oxygen here, this oxygen here, and one electron on the hydrogen. What we will then do is we'll bind the oxygen to the hydrogen. Okay? So each of them has a spare electron. We'll bind those two together to form a covalent bond. This oxygen in the middle now has two free electrons. So what we'll do is we'll bind them to the hydrogens that we got from conjugating the two glutathione molecules together to create H2O water. Okay, right. So, basically, what we're going to get then, um, well, that's going to be one of the byproducts of the peroxidase reaction. What we're then going to get is if we draw up this final molecule, here's the first carbon again with the carboxylic acid group up here. Okay, the second carbon here third carbon here, fourth carbon here, fifth carbon here, double bond here, sixth carbon here, seventh carbon here, eighth carbon there, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, okay, this thing here, and then we link the eighth and the twelfth, and we also link the ninth to the eleventh, Okay, so this was 11, 12, 13, double bond here, and then we're going to have another bond here up to, um, where were we? This was 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and then we've got the alcohol group now coming off here, so it's no longer a uh, peroxidase. 17 uh, up here, 18, 19, 20. Okay, and this molecule now is proster glandin, prostaglandin H2, or PGH2 for short. So this is PGH2. Now, from prostaglandin H2, you can make all sorts of molecules, which are collectively known as prostanoids. Okay, so let me um, denote this on the other side here. So, we have now synthesized prostaglandin H2 from um, from the um, arachidonic acid. So we started off with arachidonic acid, or all cis, uh, 5, 8, 11, 14, um, icosatetrinoic acid. We then converted it to prostaglandin G2, and then to prostaglandin H2, oops, prostaglandin H2, and we did both of these reactions via the cyclooxygenase enzyme. Okay, either cyclooxygenase 1 or cyclooxygenase 2. What we can then convert, there are a variety of enzymes which act on prostaglandin H2, and they convert it into molecules that are collectively known as prostanoids. So any molecule that's synthesized from prostaglandin H2 is then a prostanoid. So, what molecules do these include? Well, they include all the other prostaglandins. Okay, so prostaglandins are all prostanoids. They're all synthesized from prostaglandin H2. They include the prostacyclins, okay, uh, of which uh, PGI2 is an example. They include the thromboxanes. Okay, right. So, these are all examples of prostanoids. Now, basically, 
If we block the cyclooxygenase enzyme, we block the production of prostanoids. They thought, um, the um, people who did this experiment, Felatu and Van Hoote, uh, Van Hoote rather, uh, thought that maybe the endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor was a prostanoid. How can we make sure that it's not? Well, we can block the production of all prostanoids. We can use a drug which blocks the cyclooxygenase enzyme, both isoforms, both COX-1 and COX-2. We can use a non-selective COX inhibitor. And there is a very nice example of this, which is the drug indomethacin, also known as indometacin. I think indometacin is actually more common nowadays than indomethacin. But this is also known as indomethacin. So either of those names, they're referring to the same drug, indomethacin, indometacin. They're the same thing. Uh, they are non, it's a non-selective inhibitor of cyclooxygenase enzymes. So if we douse our donor, uh, our donor artery, okay, back here, if we douse our donor artery in indomethacin, it will block the production of all prostanoids. We can then stimulate our donor artery with acetylcholine or carbocol again and collect the... Um, fluid that we are uh, perfusing through it and then pump it through the detector a blood vessel and see if we get a hyperpolarization and if the endothelium dependent hyperpolarization factor was a prostanoid then we would no longer get a hyperpolarization and we do so that shows us that this endothelium dependent hyperpolarization factor is not a prostanoid it is not something that is downstream of the prostaglandin h2 it did not require the cyclooxygenase enzyme to make it Okay, and that's what uh, Fellatu and Van Hoot showed in 1988.